Hi, everyone. Just before we get going, I want to remind you that everything we talk about and discuss should not be considered as investment advice. The purpose of what we talk about on Catherine Murray Media and Markets on YouTube, as well as Catherine Murray in conversation with on my podcast, should be viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Please definitely do your own research, your own homework, and definitely consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions. And also to note, some of us might hold positions in some of the stocks uh, that we discuss. Martin, great to be able to catch up with you and get your thoughts, and certainly a lot going on as we are in an election period. Um, And I think that you are still focused on what so many of us are focused on, and we can talk about why we should be focused on, which is uh, Trudeau's comments that he doesn't really focus or doesn't focus on monetary policy. Monetary policy, I mean, we just got the highest inflation reading in 10 years. So what does that say when someone says, I don't really care about monetary policy? They don't. What, what don't they care about in, in layman's terms? Okay, so back it up. I mean, obviously, government has to separate themselves from monetary policy and the role of the central bank. However, that said, uh, that mandate's coming up for renewal at the end of the year. And, and so, you know, have it, the government certainly will have a role to play in influencing uh, said targets for inflation. And so understanding that role that the government plays, tying into fiscal policy, monitor and fiscal go hand in hand in regards to its impact on the economy and on Canadians. Now, as you mentioned, 3.7%, that's the largest inflation rate we've had in a decade. Now, central bankers and the government is telling us that it's only temporary, it's transitory. However, uh, what happens if, if it isn't transitory? What happens if food staples and housing costs uh, continue to rise. And that's going to be directly related to interest rates, which is monetary policy. And therefore, it's the role of the prime minister to understand monetary policy and its impact on the economy. To say that he's not looking at it is irresponsible and uh, quite, uh, quite frankly, uh, disconcerting. And and what do you think that, you know, a viewer should, should take away from that? And you know, what do you think viewers are actually experiencing as it relates to inflation? Because sometimes, you know, you can look at these numbers and they don't really represent what's going on in society or in the economy, because going back, I forget how many decades ago now, I had a conversation with somebody about this, that, 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 you know, obviously they started to strip certain aspects of inflation out. But that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, anybody listening, who's what do you think they're feeling at home? Well, I, I, I love boots on the ground examples. So I spent my holiday out in Whistler and uh, it was an amazing place to visit and it's probably one of the best places in the world to live. Um, however, um, that's reflected in the cost of living. Meeting with some locals on my bikes, it, my son is a pretty serious radical bike rider and he was riding with some pros out on the hill and these pros have lived there. Um, some of them have of other jobs besides biking, such as uh, um, being a chef, for example. Um, And the comment from them was that we didn't get in the housing market. And so we're uh, thinking of leaving this wonderful place because we just can't afford to live here. And restaurants have two or three hour waits because there isn't staff to serve those restaurants because the cost of living is too high. Now that's that's a serious situation. I'm using a particular area like Whistler that's just a high destination point. Um, and the American board had just opened when I was there. But these situ- this situation still applied prior to that American board opening. And I think it's more pronounced in areas like Toronto and Vancouver, where um, it's 15 times the average income to buy a home. Food prices are through the roof. Then you have home heating costs this winter um, from higher commodity prices that are going to be even higher due to a carbon tax. And so we're having all of these policies that are allowing this inflation to continue uninhibited and telling us that, hey, don't worry, it's only transitory. Mm-hmm. Now, if that isn't the case, uh, there's gonna be a lot of grumpy people this this winter. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's been so difficult already, you know, if I just even look at the, the retired segment of the population that because of the financial crisis and the COVID impact, you know, they were savers and they can't, they can't make ends meet. 
um, you know, on 1% in the bank, if they're even getting that's probably 30 basis points yep. in cash account. Um, and then add on to that inflation. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's probably a pretty very scary time in some ways. And, and again, to hear someone not think about it is even more scary. No, absolutely. So it's almost a perfect storm for retirees who happen to not live in those jurisdictions or live in those juris- who live in those jurisdictions and don't have their money in real estate. Um, and so, you know, the traditional way you would work hard your life and then uh, retire and put it in a five-year ladder GIC strategy. Well, if inflation stays at 3.7% or let alone if it goes even down to three or even higher, um, given where current low interest rates are at, 10-year treasuries are what at 1.1% or something around there, um, you're going to lose a lot of money. That, those, those assets that you've saved aren't going to, are going to depreciate over time. And, um, and not only are, they, are you unable to fund your lifestyle, you're going to rapidly deplete uh, those assets simply because there isn't any safe uh, alternatives. And so, you know, and, and then they're told to go into the stock market that's trading at all time highs. And uh, so they're in a real rough position. And to hear, uh, I mean, it's a different story if you happen to have a $5 million home in North Van. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, you ask the people living in, I call it the eye of the hurricane in Manitoba, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, um, you know, they haven't experienced the same kinds of gains on real estate. And so, you know, what do they do in this low rate environment? Mm-hmm. And you wonder what the young people are going to end up doing as well, um, not being able to get into the, the market. I mean, again, that's not necessarily a government item per se, although, you know, faster regulation, less red tape would allow more building sooner than later. I mean, I've had a lot of those conversations as well, how much longer it actually takes to get something built in Canada uh, versus the United States. It's pretty astonishing. But but Martin, what, what does that mean for you then when you look at clients' portfolios and, and where they could and should be invested? Well, you know, so if you don't have exposure to that real estate component or if um, or assets that are hedged against an inflation that are going to appreciate, you should certainly take a look at making some adjustments to, to your portfolio. And so, for example, um, this is why it could be very beneficial for Albertans um, in particular. And for those young people looking at and moving to where there are opportunities, you want to go where the puck is going to be, not where it is. And, and so you look at regions that have exposure to commodities in particular. Um, we've been in a bear market for commodities for um, probably a greater part of a decade or more. And it's been underinvested in. And so for every 1% rise in inflation, Vanguard did a study showing that commodity prices will increase by 7 to 9%. Yeah. And so that's a material exposure. And uh, all kinds of commodities looking at uh, from agriculture, to oil and gas, uh, to materials. And so those regions that have exposure to those, uh, to those areas are going to benefit and are, are, are going to, to grow alongside and mitigate some of those inflation costs. And there's, there's, and there's a reason why you know, Alberta does have the highest uh, in, per capita income in the country because you know, it still hasn't gone away since uh, the, the boom from 2000 through to 2014 before oil prices collapsed. And so it happened to sustain itself. And we think that's going to continue to be the case. So for an investor from a portfolio standpoint, instead of just moving to wonderful places like my plug for Calgary, um, is you know having some commodity exposure in your portfolio uh, certainly doesn't hurt. And uh, if you look at the commodity index to the S&P, it's never been this low and, and it keeps getting lower. And people have been showing that chart for five or five years or more. And it's been a, a, a value trap. But um, if you're averaging in and having some exposure there, I think it's a good place to be. So um, when we think then about the commodity complex, you mentioned a couple of different areas like energy, materials, et cetera. But where do you, where do you have, and I mean, I've been invested in a number of energy companies, um, hopefully catching the bottom and have been up pretty significantly. So are you looking at more of an ETF that encompasses all of them from a commodity complex perspective or... You know, or would you just look at like the energy sector ETF or what have you? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the uh, the most efficient and effective way to do that is to own the ETF because you can make the wrong call on a stock and it's not going to participate to the upside. So there are some stocks in the energy sector, for example, that haven't participated as well as some of the ones that you own because, you know, you've done your research and, you know, which companies are, are better run. 
Um, so owning the index itself is, is not a bad place to be. So for example, even in the large caps, uh, Suncor is on the perform recently due to some um, fundamentals with Four Hills and such, and, and, and Synovus and C&Q have done very well. Um, all three of them are have a heavy weighting in the XCG capped energy index. And so um, having an exposure to the index is, is probably the best way to play it. Um, if you don't have the time to do the, the research or, you know, there are, I don't, it's besides Eric, not <laughs> Eric, not I'm not sure there's too many energy fund managers around in Canada these days. So, um, Happy so Tom pardon me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. the last men standing or woman standing, um, is probably not a bad place to be because they've been able to survive the chaos in the sector. So there is yeah. some active management strategies there as well. It, but my point too in asking you that is, are you more interested in owning an energy ETF or are you interested in the materials sector? Are you interested in chemicals? Are you interested yeah. in um, industrial metals? So what, yeah. what, what do you think is most interesting? Um, all of them. Um, I take the portfolio approach. And so, you know, owning exposure to those areas, I mean, even on the material side um, and, and its relationship to the, uh, building out of the EV narrative. I mean, there's all, all already been a big move there. And I think the narrative has gotten ahead of itself. But um, once it does settle down, having some exposure uh, to those areas certainly makes it very interesting. And then there's the agriculture where we've been spending some more time on. And how, how is the best, play, the best way to play agriculture? Do you do it through companies like John Deere, Mosaic, or um, Nutrien, or to do it through, you know, we've uh, dipped our toes into uh, the DBA and agriculture commodity index itself. But you what, have to be the D, it's, it's called the, it's the ticker is DBA. So it's in the US. So it allows you to own physical uh, commodities in, in agriculture. So canola, grain, and such. Now, D DBA. DBA is a ticker. Okay. And uh, so we own, we own some of that. And, and for example, you have to be very careful about commodity specific ETFs on the structure and how they're set up and how they roll over on near month or and such as we saw what happened with the USO last year going yeah. uh, and, and, and causing oil prices to go negative. So you want to be careful about that and understanding backwardation and contango and how that plays a role in pricing and whether it's a drag or a, a positive benefit to those ETFs. And so that's why they get a little bit tricky and probably better left to professional managers out there. But um, owning some raw commodities themselves is probably not a bad place to be. And uh, there are plenty of uh, ETFs and ways to do that, albeit in, in agriculture, gold or silver and such. And Martin, I have to just ask you, um, speaking of energy, I turn the air conditioning off because it is too loud, I find, when I'm taping. I'm dying of heat. <laughs> I think you are wearing a turtleneck and what looks to be a heavy jacket. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What is the weather like there? Speaking of energy and energy needs, air conditioning versus heat, what is going on there? I know. <laughs> it's, we're, uh, we're just above 10 degrees in Calgary, so uh, it's time to get the fall wardrobe out. Wow. Um, fall happens to me in my favorite time of year, so um, <laughs> I've been itching. It. Yeah, I've been in, itching to get the turtleneck and the, uh, and the wool jackets out, so maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but... <laughs> Uh, fall in Calgary in late August is probably not too unreasonable. <laughs> wow, I love it. Okay, because we, we've got a bit of a heat wave here in Toronto, so <laughs> yeah. I had to ask. Yeah. Uh, but that's the great thing about Canada, cross country, we've got so many different amazing aspects. Um, just continuing on the uh, the investment front, though. So what else? So you're, you're expecting some type of inflation. You want to have commodity exposure. Um, what don't you want to own, maybe? Uh, technology. Um, really? Yeah, and... It, it's, it, that, that is a huge call. So um, we still, we could be wrong. And, and, and so we always, we don't make huge binary uh, calls. Um, we, we think that um, we're, we're more of a non-dualistic approach to investing and in right black and white. And often it's shades of gray. And that could be a very dark shade of gray or a very light shade of gray. Um, and so when you make a binary call, you could be completely wrong. But if you take a look at what caused the bursting of the tech bubble in 2000, it was Greenspan announcing that they were going to raise interest rates. And all of a sudden, capital didn't flow as easily to those sectors that were very capital dependent because they weren't uh, trading, uh, weren't able to generate sufficient cash flow to meet uh, their growth needs. And so I think the same scenario plays out today. 
I think the same scenario plays out. Um, I mean, these companies are going to be around. Um, and like, for example, there are areas of the market that um, are very uh, frothy and gotten, and in our opinion, gotten way ahead of themselves. And for a great example is I think there's a, an analogy of the clean energy, clean tech space and EVs and Tesla to the build out of the internet back in the late 90s. And you had Cisco, for example, leading that charge. And Cisco at that time in 2000, right before the meltdown, was the largest company in the, in the world. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it was doing some fantastic things and, 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 and you know, very innovative. But, at that, uh, but it got ahead of itself, obviously. And the tech rollover caused it to lose 80% of its value. Still a great company. Increased its revenue by 300% since then. Um, and now it's back to where I think it's 10% below where it was in 2000. So I yeah. think the same situation is going to play out for many of these companies like a Tesla, for example. I think they're going to be around, um, but there's a lot of risk um, in built into the valuations. And so what's going to be the catalyst to get that to happen? Um, it could be interest rates um, and it could be uh, the, the not efficient deployment of that fiscal spending into supplementing that transition. So what happens if if Biden's unable to get OPEC to increase oil prices to mitigate the gasoline uh, demand problem and pricing problem and inflation problem, they may have to redirect some of that capital and slow down the pace of that transition to uh, clean energy and renewables. Um, and especially if you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, um, a, a good friend of mine runs, a, I'm not going to say which one, but runs a, uh, a very large uh, fund that invests in infrastructure alongside you know, renewables and such. And uh, he was saying they just sold a project that, you know, was generating a 3% uh, at the level they sold it at was generating a 3% rate of return, internal rate of return on that project, assuming no cost overruns. And so there's the margin for error is, is slim to none in that sector and your returns are ultra low. Hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, um, you know, you just going back for one second in terms of what you said, you know, Biden needing OPEC to, to increase the supply, um, you know, to obviously not weigh on the inflation concerns in the United States as well, um, they could call Canada. They could. <laughs> they could. Trudeau could pick up the phone too. Maybe he has. We hope he has. But anyway, um, so so you're you're betting against tech. I guess the one follow up question I would have is, um, you know, within tech though, is there? And I, I so hear you it, it, as it relates to the tech boom in the United States, you know, I was working in equity research at William Blair during those days. And it was amazing once the tech boom bust, so many of these great companies are still great companies, still making money, of course, but the stock prices were down, you know, significantly 50, 70%. And, you know, it's taken almost 20 years to get back to where they were. I mean, it's pretty astounding. Having said that though, is there a company like an Apple yeah. that you know many would say the valuation is actually not stretched cash flow generation we're still in the mix midst of, of using their entire ecosystem yeah so so that's a great question i cast a pretty wide net when i said technology and so uh and let's narrow that net down quite a bit so those the fun the, the big companies like the googles and the and the amazons and i mean and and, and the apples you know, those companies aren't as much at risk as some of the fringe technology companies, especially in the clean tech space, solar companies, renewable renewables, and uh, electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh. And, and, and even in some of the consumer electronics. And so the, the issue is what's going to be a catalyst for these companies that have uh, such uh, high cash flow burn rate in absence of government subsidies and aren't sustainable on themselves, especially when their network and their ecosystem isn't built out. There is no ecosystem to tap into and scale and, and, and build out in, in the EV space, for example. They're, we're talking about building the infrastructure for that. Um, and that's in the early stages. In the meantime, um, you know, the, uh, other countries like in Europe are bringing on more coal fire generation to offset the existing uh, needs. They all like wearing turtlenecks in Germany. so. You know, you're going to have to run the air conditioners year round in, in high pace. So, 
But anyway, the, the point being is that uh, scale and convenience are, two, are, are the two biggest factors when it comes to, and you would probably know that through your research, when it comes to scaling. And, and so you have to have a price point that is very attractive to consumers. And so the lost lead model in the technology space has been the predominant model where you're giving away a product that at cost or below cost to build out your own ecosystem or partnering with somebody else to tap into that ecosystem and then bringing on premium services, okay? And it has to be convenient. So when Apple rolled out their iPhone, it was, it was affordable, high expensive, but very affordable. Um, it was tapping into the existing network that was already built out thanks to uh, the work that companies like Cisco did. They tapped into that and built and were able to scale it out. And it was convenient. It was awesome. It changed lives. All of a sudden, you could do all kinds of things from your phone. And, and, it, and now you go to a restaurant, you go anywhere, you see people have their phones. And so they tapped into that power and, and, and they were able to do so. Whereas you look at other technology companies that don't have that infrastructure built out yet. Um, it's just a story. It's just a narrative. Uh, EVs do not have the infrastructure to build to tap into. We're so far from that, um, especially in the renewable side. And so it makes for a great story. I would love to live in that in, in that world. I like. I'm a car guy. I rebuilt old muscle cars with my dad growing up, um, and I've driven EVs. I love them. They're fantastic, um, but they're very expensive, uh-huh. and. Um, they're not convenient at all. Zero convenience. I go. I went skiing 50 times last year. Um, there's two plugins at the Lake Louise Ski Resort for EVs, and you're only allowed to park it there until it's done charging. Um, and so, I mean, that's a big drive, and that's a, a, a big inconvenience. Okay. And so, you know, that's not going to happen for me. And by the way, I have to haul a, a whole bunch of kids and put uh, my uh, my skis and all the equipment in the back of it. And I'm going to drop $150,000 for that? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Um, Martin, what um, what would you, in addition to commodities and the commodity complex, what, what do you want? What else do you want to be overweight in these days? Or do you uh, even want to be overweight? Are you more neutral? Um, so uh, other areas that are of interest to us are uh, finally the value side of, of, of the trade. And there are some, some value ETFs out there that will do that for you or value managers. Um, we've seen a rotation into value and back out of it. And uh, value will outperform in, in a commodity rallying environment and an in, and, and interest rate rising environment compared to growth. And so we've increased, we're not overweight, but we've we had a zero weight um, in that, in that segment of the market, we've now increased it to a a market weight and we don't like buying when things are going lower. We like buying when they're going higher, um, and they've got some momentum behind them. And so that would be the catalyst for us to increasing our weighting. Uh, we also like, uh, jurisdictions like the EFI markets that almost are a value in itself because they've been a significant underperformer. Um, we like, uh, areas, we are worried about the Canadian dollar, and we can talk about that, but uh, we are very worried about the Canadian dollar, um, and, uh, and so we like to find areas that could replace the exposure to the commodity sector, such as emerging markets, ex-China, um, that will benefit from that, and their currencies won't be as impacted as ours due to, uh, I-, I like to call it idiosyncratic risk or political risk that could influence the, the dollar. Hmm. Um, why ex-China? Uh, we're worried about China. Um, China is is further ahead in its cycle post-COVID recovery. Also, uh, there's been a fundamental shift in regards to the regulatory environment and its impact on technology companies and its heavy weight there, as we've seen some of the uh, uh, challenges with listings in the U.S. and such. And we think that's only going to get worse. That's a fundamental shift with the policies of that government's undertaking. Um, also, I look- tried to walk that back, though, in the past yep. 24 hours. So I don't know. Well, it rears its ugly head every four years, it seems. Yeah. And I, I just I don't I don't like when government is involved in, in a sector, um, especially from the regulatory standpoint. So sure, you could try and play that trade. But uh, China has changed quite a bit. So if I'm going to have some emerging market exposure, there was a great chart I, I posted on Twitter today showing the correlation between Canada and emerging markets. And it's actually gone negative. Um, and typically there was a strong correlation between the two because of that commodity exposure. Uh, China, 50% of its index is technology stocks. 
And so uh, if I'm going to own technology stocks um, and emerging technology stocks, and we do have some exposure to private equity side through, uh, through Israel, for example, um, I'm going to invest in Israeli tech or even U.S. tech uh, through VC, more so through China. Uh, the regulatory risk, the transparency risk, and, uh, and the expertise you need to invest in the sector is just too high. And so that's what I mean by being underweight China in itself. Got it. Um, Mark, we're going to wrap here, but, but before we do, I just want to ask um, a, a question in terms of how you operate for your clients. It, it sounds as though it is strictly ETFs, correct? No. So we're agnostic. We're, we're agnostic. Okay. Okay. So we, we take something called a goals-based benchmark approach for all of our clients. So, I mean, the problem is, is that when you're measuring performance, what index do you use? So over the last 10 years in U.S. dollars, the TSX um, has only earned the annual rate of return of 3.7%. So if I use that as an index, we're going to do fantastic. Um, but if I look at the U.S. market, it's done 14.7%. Um, maybe we didn't do as well. And so we avoid that all of that altogether. And we take a look at each client and say, okay, what kind of rate of return do you need specific to your goals, um, whether it's meeting a life cell objective or buying this or doing this? And if it's five or 6%, how do we get that return and mit mitigate the risk as much as possible? Okay. And so it's very unique to each client. Some clients may only need 4%. Some clients may want a higher growth in 15%. So how do we get that and mitigate the risk? And so we'll go anywhere to do that. And so we need to be flexible. So we'll have ETFs. Sometimes we'll be overweight ETFs. Sometimes we'll be underweight ETFs. Sometimes we'll be overweight active managers, maybe in, in the alt space, long short space. Maybe sometimes we'll be underweight managers. Right now we're using structured notes um, in this low rate environment. We're custom building structured notes for clients um, as a partial fixed income replacement with built-in downside barriers. We had a zero weight. Now we have you know, a 15% weight to, to structured notes. And so we have to be dynamic for the environment that we're in. And we're not tied to selling any sort of product or in-house product or anything. Uh, we're going to go to the best areas that we think that we can generate those returns and nice. mitigate the risk. Yeah. So let me just pick up on that point. In terms of the structured notes, you're saying that you are creating them for the clients. How are you doing that? Are you... Well, so we go, we have uh, a number of capital markets groups that we work with, and uh, we approach them with an, with an index that we like, that we think may have some upside. And then we'll go to them with terms around what we'd like to see, and they'll build it for us. And then uh, we'll go to them in size, partner with maybe some other uh, counselors or advisors with Wellington, and have them custom build that for us. Now, what makes this different than what you would get at a bank branch is the spreads. <laughs> Um, the spreads are enormous. The banks make a ton of money on these things. Um, whereas we used, to, we have a big background in trading options. So we understand how these things are constructed and we understand where the spreads are that the banks are taking. And we, we basically mitigate that down. We take that down quite a bit and pass along the yeah. entire That's benefit to the client. And, and so what would be an example of a structured note right now in terms of the yield and yeah. of course, you know, anybody can say, oh, 10%, but what people have to understand is the risk could be 20%. Yeah. You know, the, the, the yield should be 20% given the risk that you're taking. Yeah. So what, what do you think is kind of, um, you know, I don't know, somewhat moderate in terms of risk, what's yeah. the associated yields? So for example, we've done one on the TSX, uh, uh, just the index itself that, has been able to, to yield a six to seven percent uh, coupon. Um, as I don't pay that monthly, as long as uh, the index doesn't drop more than twenty five percent. And if it does drop more than twenty five percent, you don't get that monthly yield. At the end of the at the end of twelve months, if the index is above five percent, what you paid, uh, you get your bond gets called away and you get your money back. And so that's a perfect example of something that be moderate risk level, and you've got a built in twenty five percent downside. Um, and you keep getting paid until until that happens. And is there a chance of a twenty five percent correction in the in the index? Absolutely, there is. Um, is what's the probability of a twenty five percent drop in a seven year period? It's never happened, <laughs> but it could happen. But um, you know, so those are the sorts of things. Yeah. That's yeah. helpful. That's helpful. I'm glad I asked. And then just lastly, another follow up in terms of ETFs. I think this is really important for people um, learning about you know, investing and, or if you're already doing it, 
What's the one or two pieces of advice you'd say to what kind of ETF you'd want to even own? Like, do you care a lot about assets under management? Do you care about the liquidity of the ETF? Or if it's specialized enough, do you say, you know what, just do it? What, what, what's, your, what's your approach there? Okay, so ETF investing isn't as simple as it sounds. And yeah. uh, for the average do-it-yourself investor, uh, there is some work involved. Um, you have to know what you're owning. The components within the index itself is, is very helpful. You mentioned liquidity. That's uh, very, very uh, useful. They said you can phone up the market maker and they'll make it happen, but uh, that'll impact spreads. And, uh, and, and so, you know, you have to be able to know what you own. Um, a great example is if the underlying isn't liquid, like if you look at the high yield HYG in the US, it's a high yield bond index. Um, a lot of this, uh, it's all junk bonds. And so what happens is if, for example, there's a market meltdown, um, they have to meet daily, the, the instant liquidity needs. And so they may have to sell some of the more liquid or better investments first, uh, because that's what they only can do. And so if you're the first person to hit the sell button, you're okay. But if you're the last person, what's left in that portfolio uh, that you own? So liquidity is not only... Um, by meaning that can you get your money out and without taking a big impact on the on the price that you're that you're getting, in addition to liquidity of the underlying positions within that particular ETF. And so again, it's not as easy as it sounds. So you have to be able to to, to do your homework. And yeah. and for for the uh, do it yourself investor, that's why you can buy some of these uh, encompassed balanced ETFs that may do some of that work for you. Um, and so within a smaller TFSA or something, you could buy a growth or a balance ETF and uh, they'll be able to rebalance and, and do some of that research for you. Understood. All right, Martin, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Me. Yeah. It's fun. Nice. It's like having longer conversations. Absolutely. Well, um, we'll have to do this again sometime. So the gap isn't as wide and you can fill in with some more specifics. <laughs> Uh, certainly going to be a lot to talk about with the uh, with the election in the next couple of weeks. So uh, all eyes on that and seeing what uh, I mean, we tend to think of it being more important than what the worst of the world does. But <laughs> um, I, actually, I think it is very important. You know, look, I've been talking a lot about it, but yeah, uh, our, our debt, our debt levels in this country have gone through the roof. Uh, we're over three and a half times GDP. Um, we're ahead of Greece. Uh, worse than Greece and almost catching up to China. And uh, that's a serious problem. And, uh, and, and that's primarily due to the existing government. I will pick on them. And if it was, if it was a PC government doing the same thing, I'd be mentioning the same thing over as NDP. Yeah. Um, the fact of the matter is we borrowed the most money um, in the G20 as a percentage of our economy than any other country in the G20. During, and the, pandemic. During the pandemic. Last year. Yeah. And our GDP growth is middle of the pack. So yeah. if you looked, I just told you, we look at return per unit of risk. What kind of return did we get for the amount of money that we put into the, into the economy and in the market? What yield did we get back? And I think Canadians deserve to have an answer. We don't yeah. have an answer. We haven't had a budget. We finally did get one, um, but the transparency is very poor. So we need to start measuring these things and, and seeing the impact on uh, on those dollars that are being spent and so like i said there's going to be plenty to talk about in the next uh, yeah. uh couple of weeks <laughs> okay well we'll have you back thank you, you. nice okay. uh, nice seeing you again take care you too. talk to you later